Hey, Jenny and Levi Lusco here, <laughs> and we want to welcome you to this Fresh Life Church message archive from the 2020 series. As we're taking time to get ready for this next new year by building faith and asking God to open the eyes of our heart. Throughout this series, we're asking every single person who's a part of and touched by the ministry of Fresh Life Church to consider what God would have you to give in a special year-end offering that we'll be receiving on December 8th. And all across the church, children and families, single people, married people, every kind of person is considering what this ministry means to us and how God's touched our lives through it right. and how we can be a part of expanding the footprint of it and uh, seeing it go into new places and spaces and reach more people. That's right. We're we're so excited for this time together and this this opportunity to get to really um, see what what God's put in us, what He has for us, but then what He wants to do yeah, through us. That's exactly right. And we're we're just so excited. And that includes you. Whether you watch these messages online or you listen to the podcast, you can be a part of it. We right. love to send you a 2020 kit with everything you need to participate in and be a part of what God's doing. No matter where you live in the country, no matter where uh, you watch these messages, God could use you to help us reach more people. That's right. And in this gift, we have a little um, necklace. And really, it's just a, a symbol, a token of um, of of seeing the king. So basically it's a little crown and it's really cool. And I have one on here, he has one on. Yep. Um, but just a reminder of above all else, above everything that we wanna see the king, that we wanna see Jesus lead us and use us for his glory. That's right, to so get your own 2020 kit, including your beautiful crown necklace that you can wear over your heart as you pray about what God would have you to give in this series and this offering, doing so online, whether that's a gift of $5,000 or $500 or $5, whatever it would take you to use faith and sacrifice to give to be a part of this. This is something we'd love to send to you free of charge. You can get it two ways. Uh, you can either text the number 97,000, you see it on the screen, and include the word giving kit, or send an email with your name and address to online at freshlife.church. And we'll send one of these your way that you can so that you can participate in what God's doing here at this church. Yeah. Yes. Well, enjoy this message from God's Word. Luke chapter 4 is where we're going to be. I love this passage. It's the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. You could say that it's the, it's the first day reporting for duty as the Messiah. Now, there's a lot we don't know about Jesus' upbringing. I mean, we know a lot about the circumstances under which he was born, right? Some wise men, some shepherd, a circumcision, a crazy king. Y'all don't read the same Bible I do? That's all in the Christmas story. What church do you go to on Christmas Eve? I always pick the weird passages. Because, you know, I've, I've been doing this, uh, you know, 14, this is 14 years this January, by the way, that we've been, we've been to church together. Um, and so I was telling somebody the other day, the most stressful time is, is like, is the, the normal ones. Because like, there's, there's only so many ways you can preach the wise men. And I'm like, I did that in 2000. It's like, everybody at this angle. Yeah, I did that in 2009. What were you doing that year? You know what I'm saying? Like, and so like, then I start like branching out a little bit. Like, because Jesus got circumcised on the eighth day. So that's technically, like, it's a little bit of a stretch. But that was before the wise men. I know that messes with your nativity set. But <laughs> he got circumcised before the wise men even showed up. Weird, right? Uh, so that's uh, one angle that I've taken. So we know a lot about um, we, we know a lot about Jesus's you know birth, and we know a lot about his thirtieth uh, birthday forward until his uh, death on the cross, resurrection, hello, yeah. ascension to heaven, <laughs> promise to return, sending of the Holy Spirit to fill the believers who trust him for power from on high. We know a lot about that. But, but, but you look at his life, 33 and a half years, you know a ton about the last three years and a, and a good bit about the first week, <laughs> right? Like a lot. A disproportionate amount of information is given to his birth. And, and then we, we got like what? One story where his parents should have put a low jack on him because they lost him. They lost him, right? Every parent's been there, all right? How many, how many parents have not lost their kid at some point? Yeah, exactly. I've lost all my kids multiple times, you know? <laughs> One time we were leaving this hotel, and we're doing a head count in the car. I'm like, where's Olivia? No Olivia. So we, we rush, I rushed back in. We had checked out of this hotel. We left her in it. Yeah. It happens, you know? It's like you, you leave a watch in a drawer. You leave, you leave your wallet in the safe. You, 
I left some face wash in a hotel the other day. I was real frustrated about that because it was a brand new bottle of face wash, three and a half ounces. Because I love to be a scientist when I'm buying uh, bath products, you know. Is this going to be able to go in the carry-on? I saw this lady the other day at TSA. She had a, she had a 64-ounce, big gulp-sized bottle of shampoo. I saw her pull it out. It was in a hefty bag. And she, she pulls it out of the hefty bag. She says, is this all right? And I'm like, oh, she's like, good luck with that one. You know what I'm saying? So it was three and a half ounces. I only used it one time. And uh, I left it in this hotel. I was frustrated. So I had to go buy another one. And, and I was buying it, and the lady said... You like this brand? I'm like, I don't know. I only, I only used it once. Because the last time I bought it, I left it in the hotel. She goes, I hope, someone, I, hope, I hope it went to someone who needs it. I was like, you think, you think someone's using it right now? That disturbs me more than me losing it. Like, how does, like, and then my mind's going, like, did the maid pocket it? Give it to her boyfriend? Hey, this is supposedly going to help you out with your oily skin. That's what, that's what this is for. Um, now you know too much. But we do know what happened when Jesus came to Nazareth. That's Luke 4, verse 14. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been raised, he went into the synagogue, as he always did on the Sabbath day. I guess we know more about his life than we thought we did. Because we know what he always did on the Sabbath day. He got himself to church. So now we know something about 52 days a year. Jesus showing up to church on a good day, on a bad day. He showed up with God's people to sing the songs of the people of God, to open up the scripture of God, to be challenged by spending time with God's family in God's house, as he always did on the Sabbath day. There's a lot of talk about what would Jesus do. Well, on Sunday, we should go to church, right? That's what Jesus did on Saturday. Anyhow, you know, we didn't need to get into that. When Jesus came to the front to read the scriptures, because it would rotate responsibility, it was kind of like a small group. It was like, who wants to read the scripture? Who wants to pray? Don't you love the weird things we do in small groups? Who wants to open all close? Right? I remember in, in small groups, when I, was, when I was young, and first in small groups, this was like early high school, like ninth grade. In small group, they would ask for prayer requests. And uh, sometimes it would be like all these, you know, freshman boys who were like in love, love sick, you know, but the crush didn't love them back. And so they would have a prayer request, but they couldn't say, I pray that Veronica would like me back. So they would just say, I have an unspoken. Do you remember an unspoken? <laughs> Some church people up in here, you know, an unspoken. I mean, they got a prayer. I just can't say it, you know, which is code for <laughs> I like her, but she didn't like me. And so you're unspoken. Unsp I have an unspoken. <laughs> OK, we're going to pray for Billy's unspoken. Ted, I also have an unspoken. It, it also concerns Veronica. <laughs> now, Fred, who was the third, he didn't have an unspoken. It's because Veronica liked him. You know, he, Fred's like, nah, I'm good. I don't got no prayer request today. I'm excited about life. It's living my best life right now, right? In Jesus' small group, they rotated the responsibility to read the scriptures. Is it OK if we have a little fun while we read? When Jesus came to the front to read the scriptures, they handed him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. That was that week's portion. He unrolled the scroll. I can't think about Jesus unrolling the scroll, though, without my mind going to Revelation, when as the lion of the tribe of Judah who prevailed by being the lamb who was slain, he takes the scroll from the Father's hand. And John doesn't need to worry anymore because he has prevailed. Even though he hasn't done it yet, he has prevailed. His victory is so certain we can talk about it in the past tense. Come on, somebody. He has prevailed. Tell your neighbor. I know they're worried. Tell him he has prevailed. He will prevail. He is prevailing. Come on, he's doing it right now. He unrolled the scroll and read where it is written. Now he's going to quote from Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to be hope for the poor, freedom for the brokenhearted, and new eyes for the blind, and to preach to prisoners. You are set free. I love, by the way, that as we preach week in and week out, we're getting to preach messages like this inside 
a state penitentiary. I love very much that we get to do what Jesus said the gospel is always supposed to do, and that is to go to those who are incarcerated. But guess what? Not everybody who needs to hear a message of freedom is locked up physically. We need to hear the message of the gospel because we get locked up spiritually, locked up on the inside. And here he introduces some of the reasons we needed a Messiah because of poverty, because of brokenhearted, because of spiritual and, and real blindness, because of, of, of prison, and because of the reasons people go to prison, and because of what it does to us to live outside of a jail and a prison on the inside of our own making. He says, I have come to share the message of Jubilee, for the time of God's great acceptance has begun. Then Jesus, armed with the Holy Spirit's power, the same power, by the way, that he promises in you. As his followers, we've been given access to the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. You got it tomorrow when your nosy coworker is driving you crazy? You, you, you got that same power when you're frustrated with your husband? You got that same power when your kids are driving you crazy? Come on, we, have, we just have to ask for it. We just got to tap into it. God's given you the power. Don't save the crazy big power for only the crazy big needs. Use that power even when it feels like overkill to ask God for his help. Ask for his help when you have a headache. Ask for his help when you're stressed out. Ask for his help. Someone, I was talking to a member of our church a while back, and they said to me, they said, you were preaching about the other day about uh, testing and how when you're worried about tests, you don't do well on tests. And the, worry, the time you spend worrying actually makes you do worse at tests. Listen to me, students. They've proven your cognitive horsepower is limited. So anything you give over to worrying is that much of your brain's RAM that can't be used to actually performing on the test. So I just threw it out there that worrying makes you worse. And so you know, worship instead of worry, because you can't worship and worry at the same time. And so when you, when you worship instead of worrying, when you pray instead of giving over to those anxious thoughts that churn inside your head, I just threw it out there as a little you know, aside. I had done a ton of research on it when I was writing my book, I Declare War, and kind of just threw that out there in a sermon. And a guy said to me, that was the most helpful thing I've ever heard, because I've really been having a hard time with some tests I've been taking lately. And that was, that was a confirmation to me of what, what I needed to hear. And I just I love that God does that. He'll just speak to us exactly what we need. But, but I say that because because God cares about how he takes his tests. And God cares about whatever little silly thing you got going on in front of you tomorrow. I joke, but God does care if you like Veronica, too. You can give God your love sickness. You can give God your he loves me, he loves me not. Just cast all your cares on him. It doesn't say just give him the big stuff. It doesn't say, it's not like God's so busy on this impeachment trial that, he, that he's got, he, I, don't bother me. I'm working here. I got the fate of the free world. Is it really? Let me tell you, he'll pause everything. He'll quiet everything. <laughs> My daughter Daisy in the front row, she could interrupt me right now if she needed to. She wouldn't because she's so sweet. But she, I'll tell you what, I would stop everything to talk to Daisy. And just like, just like that, your father cares for you. So you rush in. The time of acceptance has begun. And you are accepted as a child of God. The middle wall of separation has been torn down. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, barbarian, Scythian, male, female. Come on, we all stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. <laughs> acceptance has begun. You're accepted. And that is probably the biggest crisis any of us will ever face, feeling like we're not accepted, feeling like we're rejected from some community, some club, some group, some, some circle. I'm not in that in crowd. There, what, tell me a better crowd than to be in with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good crowd to run with. And you're accepted by all three. So he liked you, so he put a ring on you. That's literally the definition of the Holy Spirit, an earnest or a down payment. Or you could say an engagement ring. The Bible has promised the Holy Spirit in our hearts as an engagement ring, a pledge of the promise for him to return and bring us to be with him in heaven forever. So that's the Holy Spirit, God's gift to you, promising more to come. Armed with the Holy Spirit's power, we're just reading the Bible here, returned to Galilee, and his fame spread throughout the region. He taught in the synagogues, and they glorified him. After he read this, he rolled up the scroll, he handed it back to the minister, he sat down, and everyone stared at Jesus, wondering what he was about to say. Then he added, these scriptures came true today in front of you. Why? Because God's promise to send someone who would open the eyes of the blind had finally come to pass. Jesus, would you speak to us just something powerful from this text? And in our time together, considering how we might continue to be a part of its fulfillment today, may we see God 
that what we do in these Holy Spirit drenched days of this 2020 series, may we see that in a very real sense, it links back and connects to what caused the mic to drop from Jesus' hand and the jaws to drop in that room that day. As, as, as your son said, this is fulfilled. This begins here and now. And we get to continue to run with that baton in our hands. What an honor it is, Jesus. And we ask also that if even one person has come in today who doesn't know you as Savior, you would draw them to yourself. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The kingdom of God is all about vision. And really, the meta story that runs all throughout Scripture is all about vision. We were created to know God and to be known by God, to walk with God, as it were, in the cool of the day, to get to see him in his glory, that right now, somebody's like, I want to see God. You know, yeah. like, like, you, what do you think? You're asking to see the manager at Applebee's? Like, I'd like to see God. He's got some, some things to explain to me when I stand before him. <laughs> yeah, um, so about that, if you stood before God right now in his blinding glory, it would melt you. Not like metaphorically, just actually, like in Indiana Jones, like when the Ark of the Covenant's open and the guy melt, it would melt you. You can't handle that. It will melt you in your sinful. It wasn't always so. Without sin, without the decay, without the, the treachery that we invited into humanity, we could just chill with God, hang with God, walk with God, see God with our eyes. Moses asked to see God. Let me see a little bit of your glory. He's like, I, well, I would love to, but I don't, wanna, I don't have a mop, actually, is the problem, Moses. <laughs> so here's what we'll do. I'll tuck you behind this rock, and I'll pass by, and I'll say all the, all the oxen free when I'm gone. And then you come out, but just the, the haze of glory is going to be so thick that you'll get to see that. You get to see my afterburn, you know, like the trail in the sky after a plane's gone. What's that? The plane was here. That's what Moses came out and stumbled into, and he glowed for a month. Yes. Radioactive, radioactive. Right, little Imagine Dragons up there on Mount Sinai. That's what happened when he saw God's exit strategy. And yet, in the book of Genesis, we see God just cruising with Adam and Eve. That was what we were meant to see. The kingdom of God is about sight. We need faith today because we can't see as we are seen. And the devil promised Adam and Eve, if they disobeyed God, doing the one thing he told them not to do, they would get eyesight. He, he, he was like a a bad LASIK doctor operating in Tijuana, you know, <laughs> trying to get Mexican, you know, Americans over, over the Mexican border. Like, come down and come down. Oh, it's two for one. That means there's some things you want to get on sale. LASIK surgery, I would not put on that list. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're considering eye surgery in Mexico, might I consider the bargain uh, bin might not be where you want to have someone going through your retinas. Just a thought. Like, if my friend told me, like, I, I go across the border for surgery. I'm like, you know, <laughs> just... The life decision thing is what I would encourage you to take some time to evaluate, you know? So uh, the, the, the devil shows up. He said, if you eat the, the fruit, your eyes are going to be open. God doesn't want you to have it because he knows that your eyes will be opened. Their eyes were open just fine. The only things they didn't see were things that we would see when our eyes were opened. And that's things that we were never meant to see. Shame, nakedness, death, disease, guilt, remorse, fear, all those things we would invite into our story, things that we would never be able to unsee. We used to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day. Guess what? After Adam and Eve triggered that atom bomb, <laughs> we haven't seen God since. But all we wanted to was, all we ever wanted to do was to get back to where we once were, to where we started out at. God promised from that moment forward he would send his son to fix our eyes and to open our eyes. And the promise of the Messiah is synonymous with the promise of eyesight being restored. Because eyesight is, is central to Isaiah's vision of light coming at Christmas time. Why do you think we put lights on our Christmas trees? Christmas is all about light coming. Christmas is all about the Messiah coming to open the eyes of the blind. That's what this prophecy was that Jesus chose to announce. I'm here, and now I have fulfilled the promise for blind eyes to be open. And that's why all throughout his physical ministry, he began to literally heal blind people. 
Did it at the pool of Siloam with a man born blind. Did it with a guy who he did it in stages with. We talked about last week, the who once saw like trees and then got to see the whole forest, y'all. But first, he saw the king. We, he did it uh, with, with, with blind Bartimaeus, who cried out, son of David, have mercy on me. When John the Baptist got worried that maybe he had made the mistake anointing and baptizing the wrong Messiah figure because he got put in jail, let me tell you something. If you are going through something difficult and you're doubting right now, doubting everything, you're in good company. That's always what happens. Whenever we, 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 we get into trouble, we're always like, what's going wrong? Is there a God? I don't even know. Right? right? And, and that's what John the Baptist did. And he, he was pretty good. You know? So he's like, is everything OK? Like he asked guys, are you, are you the right Jesus? And he, he wrote back. He said, you tell this to John. He's worried. He's having a crisis of faith. Here's how you'll know this is legit. Too legit to quit. I was at an event this week, and they told me, that guy used to be in MC Hammer's band. I'm like, that's awesome. <laughs> Jesus answered them, give John this report. The blind see again. The crippled walk. Lepers are cured. The deaf hear. And the dead are raised back to life. Oh, and the poor and broken now hear of the hope of salvation. And you tell John that the blessing of heaven comes upon those who never lose their faith in me, no matter what happens. <laughs> so you can take it to the bank, bro. You can take it to the bank, cousin, that I'm, I am who I say I am. You can know it's true because, in part, the blind are seeing. But of course, it wasn't just physical vision he came to restore. Through the necessary means of his death, his burial, and resurrection, he came to make it possible for our eyes to be opened once again in heaven to what was our original state, seeing God face to face. He came to secure for us what will never be taken from us. We will get to be with God. Yeah, the gold streets are going to be great. And yes, uh, a, a sea of, of, of crystal and an emerald rainbow and all the things in, in heaven are going to be amazing. But what's going to make heaven heaven is being with Jesus, spending time with Jesus. Whether he's a kitten or a thunderstorm, we'll have all of eternity to figure out. Because he's not a safe lion, but he's good. And we will be with him, and he will be ours, and we will be his, and we will be together serving him forever in heaven. But until that day, we got work to do. What is possible? What can happen if God would save us and we wouldn't stop there? What would happen to us and through us as a church if we would fight for and beg God for and like blind Bartimaeus cry out all the louder, the weirder we felt and the stranger it seemed? What would happen if we would take a crazy, audacious step of faith as a church and an online church, greater community scattered? What if the fresh lifers all across the world who have been activated would say, God, give us a second touch. We don't just want to see for ourselves. We want to fight for other people to see. What would happen if with 20 20 vision on the inside, we all together risked everything to fight for other people to see what we have seen. I believe our faith would shake the world. Humans have five basic senses. You probably learned about them in elementary school. Touch, sight, hearing, smell, and taste. The sensing organs associated with those senses, your skin, eyes, ears, nose, and tongue, collect and send information to the brain to help us experience and understand the world around us. Hot, cold, colorful, near, far, loud, quiet, rancid, floral. Though we can adapt to living without one or more of those senses, all five sure are helpful when it comes to living and navigating our lives. But of these five, which is the most important? Some would argue that the answer is sight. 80% of what we perceive on a daily basis comes via our vision. So the way I like to look at how the eye works is um, just like a camera. So you have the front of the camera, which is the lens. In the eye, you have both the cornea and the lens of the eye. What this does is it focuses the light onto the back of the eye, which would be like the sensory part of the camera. So this way, um, the light is focused into like a nice image, which then travels through the optic nerve 
into the brain, which then your brain processes the image. If 80% of what we perceive comes through sight, it's no wonder your eye doctor is always sending you those reminders to schedule your annual eye exam. When you go to the eye doctor, uh, some things you might see is uh, this bad boy right here. Uh, this is actually gonna test the visual acuity. Um, that's essentially just how good your central vision is. 2020 is um, when you're standing at 20 feet away from this target right here, uh, the 2020 line is what the average person should be able to see. Sometimes our eyes need a little help. According to the Vision Council of America, 75% of adults in the US wear some form of corrective lens. So the way glasses and contacts work is um, they refocus the light to make sure that you can see 2020. Um, so it depends if you're nearsighted or farsighted how the lens actually works, um, whether or not it's converging the light or whether it's diverging your light, just depending on what your own eye needs. Sight requires both our eyes and our brain to work together. But even when you have a clear view of your surroundings, only a portion of the information your eyes capture is sent to your brain. Your brain receives snapshots, just three images every second, which it then sorts and combines with earlier information to create the reality you experience. As long as your eyes are open, this is constantly happening and constantly requiring energy. In an effort to conserve that energy, your brain decides what is important, what is worth looking at, based on past experience and what is required for your survival. Attention is our most essential mental resource. It determines what we focus on, what we give our energy to, the decisions that we make. Often, these choices are automatic, a subconscious process determining what we need to be consciously aware of and what we don't. Like how you can drive the same route every day from home to your office and back again without even really thinking about it. The problem comes when our brain struggles to separate what's important from, well, what isn't. Because the neurons in our brain are living cells, when they've been working hard, we experience fatigue, even when what we're processing doesn't feel like work. The average person spends over four hours a day on a device, engaged in a world of keyboard relationships and digital images. About half that time is spent on social media platforms. Every status update on Facebook, every tweet, Instagram post, or YouTube video is competing for the resources of your brain, which is also trying to remember where you put your keys, what time you need to pick up the kids from school, or how you're going to pay the mortgage this month. It's no wonder we don't recall much of what we see every day. Our attention is at max capacity. It begs the question, what else are we missing? What happens when it's not just our survival at stake, but someone else's? When we're asked to use our at capacity attention to address someone else's needs, in a social experiment conducted on a busy street corner, a person dressed as a homeless man falls to his knees on the sidewalk, then lies there for several minutes as people pass by, at times even run by, rushing through their everyday life without stopping. Many people look at the man on the ground, some hesitate, but no one stops to help. When the event is replicated, but this time with a well-groomed man in a business suit, there is an immediate response as people rush to check on him and give aid. This visual acuity test reveals a blind spot that needs to be addressed. Why don't we stop? Have we become desensitized to the needs of those around us, overwhelmed by travesties so commonplace they've become acceptable? Even when we see the need, we may be tempted to ask another question. Whose job is it to act, to feed the hungry, to clothe the homeless, to take care of orphans? If you needed food, clothing, shelter, care, where would you go? The answer is often to turn to charities, public services, or outreach organizations. According to Wikipedia, outreach is defined as an activity of providing services to any populations who might not otherwise have access to those services. A key component of outreach is that the groups providing it are not stationary, but mobile. In other words, they are meeting those in need of outreach services at the locations where those in need are. Seeing the need, meeting the need, at the place of the need. Historically, this has been a distinguishing characteristic of the church. In ancient Rome, in the days of the early church, it was common for unwanted infants to be submitted to exposure, taken to drop off locations where they were left to die, exposed to the elements. Early Christians, taking seriously Christ's command to love their neighbors, sought out these abandoned babies and took them into their own homes. Day after day, week after week, Year after year, they focused their sight on rescuing, serving, and quietly living out their faith. 
Gradually, exposure became less common, life more valued, and in AD 318, Emperor Constantine declared exposure to be a crime. By AD 374, it was a capital offense. This is why we are here, because we too understand the value of human life. Proverbs 14.31 says, Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. We have grown to know how precious we are in the eyes of a creator who would pay the highest price to save just one of us. It is because of this love that we choose to look at those around us, but not just look, we choose to see. To see those stranded in sin find life and liberty in Jesus Christ. To see the streets of our city set ablaze with hearts on fire. To see our communities experience love and healing. To see God's kingdom expanded. At the end of every year, we come together as a church to do just this, practicing a rhythm of generosity by giving above and beyond the tithe to invest in God's vision. This year, we're taking a new approach in order to position ourselves to say yes to the special work God wants to do in 2020. Before we say yes to anything in our own ministry, we've specifically singled out some things that God wants to do through our outreach partners. Why? Because as representatives of Jesus, we don't want to simply see the needs of those around us. We want to meet those needs. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you, you shall open your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. Jesus emphasized to his disciples the importance of providing food, clothing, and shelter to those who were in need. We are committed to invest in and provide for our outreach partners that they may meet the needs of those who are hungry and homeless. One of the ways we will do this is by supporting the Samaritan's Purse, a global organization committed to providing spiritual and physical aid to hurting people around the world. Since 1970, Samaritan's Purse has helped meet the needs of people who are victims of war, poverty, natural disasters, disease, and famine with the purpose of sharing God's love through His Son, Jesus Christ. Viendo personas como dormían eh, la carretera en, sin ninguna protección. Hay dos cosas que pueden suceder en el ser humano. Una es mirar las cosas y, dejar, y pasar de largo. Y otra es detenerse a ver creyendo que puedo ayudar. The border from Venezuela into Colombia. This is the main crossing point here at the Simón Bolívar Bridge. Over 35,000 Venezuelans are crossing every single day. Folks are coming across the border into Colombia to start a new life, to find hope, uh, to find a way to, to support themselves and their children. They're coming across because they see hope and opportunity over here. Because in Venezuela, currently, the hope is dying and the opportunity has gone away. Estamos agradecidos con Samaritan porque gracias a ellos hemos podido entregar eh, alimentos y estamos proveyendo de pañales eh, todo lo que es útiles de aseo personal. Es una gran bendición lo que se está haciendo en este momento. You've probably heard it said, you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach the man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. Helping others once is important, but how we help in a moment has the potential to shift the trajectory of a family's future. We are partnering with Convoy of Hope to empower and train 50 international farmers in agricultural practices, promoting longevity for their families and for generations to come. Through the agricultural program, Convoy of Hope equips vulnerable farmers and families with the skills, tools, and seeds they need to produce life-sustaining crops. Tens of thousands of meals are harvested each year for the children's feeding program, which simultaneously generates income for local farmers. Food security is crucial for communities and families around the world. When we help farmers include the food security of their communities and families, we can play a part in transforming the lives of countless people by lifting them out of dependency. The agricultural program was piloted in Haiti, where farmers didn't have access to best management practices. After being trained in agronomy, farmers in the program now grow their own crops and help sustain the children's feeding efforts in Haiti. They're also educating schools, churches, and orphanages around the world on how to start and maintain their own urban gardens. 
William Bennett, a former United States Secretary of Education, writes in an article for the New York Times saying, The family is the nucleus of civilization and the basic social unit of society. For a civilization to succeed, the family must succeed, and right now, it's not. God cares about family, and therefore we care about families. And that's why we are choosing to lock arms with our outreach partners to stand in the gap and safeguard our families. One of the global organizations we are partnering with is committed to caring specifically for families who have sacrificed to plant churches across the United States. Hey, what's going on? Dino Rizzo here with ARC uh, Association of Related Churches, and we are planting churches. You're such a part of that. Thank you so much for always being so generous. We plant churches. We help churches get started. It's a lot of times those young couples are in new communities. They're, they've got new families. They're reaching uh, into communities, or maybe they've fallen on to a tough time. So we bless them. We send them a Christmas gift, a financial gift, and it blesses them. And because of your faithfulness, because of your generosity, because you're faithful to give their fresh life, you're going to be a part of that. So this year we'll be blessing probably about 75 to 100 couples uh, with Christmas blessings and we'll take it all together and we'll look at the ones who have needs, things are going on in their life, maybe something's happened throughout the whole year or maybe something's happened right now in their family or in their young church, their new church. So thanks a lot for being so generous. Thank you for being faithful in the tithe and offering. You got great leaders there. We thank God for Levi and for Jenny. They are the real deal and uh, you have such a great church, a generous church. You're known for generosity. So Thank you so much for making a difference in pastors' lives. We love you so much from ARC. God bless you. Jesus came to heal the many wounds inflicted upon us through our lives. He is our comforter, our peace, savior, and healer. We see a world of people walking in brokenness, and we intend to bring healing to them. I'm here in the Philippines, and I'm at a ranch that is a location for children who've been rescued from trafficking. In this particular location, there's about 45 residents who live here, all girls who've been rescued. They range in age from three up to age 17. And a part of what you're gonna be helping us with here is some of the maintenance of the facilities here. And so I just wanted you to know that there's some painting that needs to be done. There's some roofs that need to be repaired. Uh, there's some ceilings in some of the dorms that uh, have fallen down and need to be replaced. So there's things here that you get to be a part of to make this place uh, a beautiful place for these children who are going through really significant recovery. So thank you for what you're going to do. We see the ruins and the rubble, the broken and the hungry, the orphaned, abused, and downtrodden. And we choose to take action, meeting those needs here, now. And in doing so, we will see Jesus' love magnified. Sisters, brothers, mothers and fathers, friends and neighbors, let's be the people we are called to be. Let us use our sight as it was designed, allowing God to correct our blurred areas and blind spots, fighting the distractions of this life and giving attention to the faces of the people we pass by. We choose to look up and reach out. There are marvelous things just waiting to be seen. So let us be a people who look through the lens of faith towards the glorious potential in our midst, past the ruins to a built up city, beyond the brokenness to the promises God has already spoken. And let's believe that as we look forward with this faith-filled 2020 vision, we will see the King. Oh, come on, you can do better than that. How excited are you? This is so much fun. Now, we are in our sixth year, just a little context if uh, maybe just coming along now, our sixth year of ending the year with our favorite tradition as a family. And that is the, right? Anybody with me on the favorite tradition? My ears popped coming up on the platform. It's like four, four steps, but like altitude. And it, oh, there we go. You know, this is not the worst feeling. I don't know if I got water in or what? Anyhow, OK, sixth year favorite tradition, and that is to end the year with an expansion offering, with a vision offering, with a faith offering. I can't think of a better way for us to prepare our hearts for the worship of Jesus at Christmas time than thanking him by not just saying thanks for coming and then buying gifts for the friends in our lives and family in our life, but to give a gift to expand his kingdom, to give a gift as a family that would 
go towards what Christmas is all about, and that is blind people seeing and poor people and those who are brokenhearted receiving comfort and help in the gospel. And so uh, we've always earmarked a portion of every offering that we've received in these six years now, this being the sixth year, we've taken 10% of it, and we've given it away to outreach partners who are doing good works throughout the world. And that's been historically such a fun thing. Uh, now, of course, this is how we moved forward as a church, too. This is how we bought the Polson building. This is how we built and bought the broadcast campus in Kalispell. This is how we were able to purchase land in Whitefish, Montana, that we own right now, that is just sitting there, waiting. There's no date set to build that building, uh, but we, we, we have in our heart to build a building there. And it will be out of these sorts of times, these faith-filled gestures of the church that we're able to build out a facility. It's how uh, these, these year-end moments of faith are how we are going to purchase land in Salt Lake City and one day build a permanent <laughs> campus in Salt Lake City. This. Year end is, is how, this is the time when, out of vision and faith, we rise up. We look at what we have, stocks that we could trade in, uh, cash and savings accounts. This is how we as a church family go, what do I believe my salvation means to me? And how can I show God that? How can I believe uh, it was sacrifice that we can expand? Uh, and this is how we are uh, going to one day build dorms for our Fresh Life Leadership College. I'm, tell, I'm telling you right now, we're going to have dorms. It's going to make it a lot easier for students to come. Y'all y'all aren't excited about dorms? That's one day. I'm telling you. And maybe this, maybe it's this year we're going to do those things. Maybe, maybe it's going to be this year we're going to open up another prison church in Oregon. Because that's in my heart. We're already looking into it, exploring with the Department of Corrections. Now, look, we don't have the funds to open a prison church in Oregon. It's expensive. We opened it last year because of the Compass Rose year-end offering. And every single week since March, we've had a service in Deer Lodge Prison. We're doing it right now. And we're about to open two more services inside the prison in other population centers. We're doing that. It's done. It's, we're doing it every, every week. And how we support that on an ongoing basis is with our normal giving. But the normal giving is not going to do extraordinary new things. And so it's going to be out of these times that we surge forward into expanding our spaces and places, building out a leadership college, opening up another prison. Those are the things that God's put in our heart. And we always take 10% of what's, what comes in, and we use that to say yes to what God's put into other people's heart. But this year, we're flipping it around a little bit. We you know, thought, it's, it's fun to give checks out. Trust me. We get to feel like Oprah every time we do this offering. We get to be, literally, we've sent people around the country, like, you get one, and you get one, just <laughs> tossing checks out. To, and of course, we vet the organizations. We make sure they're fiscally responsible. We've been doing this long enough to where we can actually work with them now. And, and this year, months and months ago, our Fresh Life Outreach team, which is doing an incredible job, by the way, they're doing. <laughs> Under the leadership of Samantha Centeno, they're doing an extraordinary job. This woman is a woman of God and her team, and they're phenomenal. So they began working with our organization saying, hey, your end's coming, and our church is a generous church. We believe uh, a lot of people in our church have been saving, myself included, been saving for this all year. Saving for this all year and, and looking forward to it and praying about it all year. And, uh, and, and what would you do? What's in your heart? We said, just start asking them, what, what are some projects they'd want to do? You saw four of them in these videos. Those are four of the projects that they came up with. They went back to us. If you gave us some money, here's how much it would take. Here's some things we would do. And those four are representative, and they're all under categories, produce, promote, provide, protect. We boiled it down to four. It's pretty preaching, too, because it all starts with the same letter. <laughs> they're all available on the Fresh Life outreach page that we put together for this series. If you use your camera. And if you, maybe you lost a little card we gave you last week. Or if you didn't get one, we're going to have ki uh, kits available, 2020 kits. The way make sure you get one. Um, and if you're watching online, we did make it available where you can get a necklace uh, and get your kit where you can give. And you can, uh, you can do that, I think, on YouTube. Down in the bottom of this, we'll put the link where if you need to register and get yours. There's a text message option, too. You can send a text message and get a necklace in the mail. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> This is the QR code. If you open your camera on your smartphone, just take, open up the camera. Don't take a picture. Just scan it and touch that QR code. A little link will pop up right in the top. Do it right now. It's really cool. It's so much fun. Play along. No? I see you disobeying. You're like, I don't want to. I'm not going to do it. Do it. OK, fine. Don't do it. Whatever. You're so cool. You don't respond. Some people are just sitting there looking at me. It's the weirdest thing. I don't get it. Um, so uh, if you touch that, I'll take you to this page where you can click those four things, produce, pr promote, provide, protect. And you will see not four outreach initiatives. You're going to see 35 of them. 
Because as we go in, as we began, yeah, as we began going to these outreach uh, departments and they started sending them back, we got so many projects back. And we were like, how are we going to pick between these? And so we started to tell these uh, groups that provided our church gives to the amount these outreaches are going to cost, we're going to do them before we do a single thing that's in our heart, before we do anything for us. Now, for us, it's a little disingenuous. <laughs> Opening a prison church in Oregon feels selfishly. That's for us. But that's something God put on our heart and burdened us to do. But we said, God, what would happen this year if we flipped it and instead said, what have you put in other ministries' heart to do around the world? And we said yes to that and put ourselves second. And when we added it up, <laughs> these 35 projects, I'm not going to lie to you. I was tempted to go, you mean you lost 15 and we're going to do 20, right? Because the amount far exceeds 10% of any offering we have ever taken up as a church. You're a generous church, but you have never, we have never given uh, to what 10% of, of, of it would be this. It was nearly half a million dollars. And yet God put it in our heart to say, so long as we as a church hit that number, we are going to do that before we do a single thing. Before we break ground in Whitefish, open a church in Oregon, build dorms, buy land, do any of the things it's in our heart to do. Now, we want to. I want to build and buy a Missoula. I want a fresh life kid space in Bozeman that's like the one at the broadcast campus. But God told us, this is what we're going to do first. And so these 35 projects are going to be at the front of our spending. And, uh, and, and then beyond that, we'll see what, what we're able to say yes to within our own heart. I'm terrified. I'm going to walk off this stage and, and have to change my pants. But I'm telling you, I'm excited. I feel like God, I feel the Holy Spirit in this. And I'm as sure about this as I've ever been about anything, which is most of the way. Most of the way, we'll find out if it was a great idea. But we're going to follow the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We're going to touch the world. I believe that, that people are going to be fed. I believe that little girls rescued Jesus. Little girls rescued from sex trafficking in the Philippines deserve a room that's been painted and a roof that's not leaking. I believe people going through disasters and people in I, I just, I feel God is going to do something miraculous in our day as we say, God, we want that second touch. But they're not just international. They're not just in Venezuela and the Philippines. We have outreach projects in every single city we are ministering in. And so to tell you about one of those, would you welcome to the stage your campus pastor? Come on. Come on. How exciting is that? Oh, my gosh. Here's what I love, too. I love the proactivity of generosity. It's not just like, all right, we'll see what happens. It's like, no, first and best, nearly half a million dollars. That's such an amazing thing that we get to be a part of. And here in Kalispell, we actually have seven of those initiatives in Kalispell, which is wild. That's a fifth of all of them. Uh, and I wanted to just touch on one. Uh, one of the partner organizations that we've chosen a partner with for this is uh, Hope Pregnancy Center. If you're, if you're aware, clearly you are. They are amazing. And so what they do is they provide services, medical and otherwise, uh, to people who have gone through and are going through pregnancy. And uh, oftentimes there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of uh, complexity that's involved in that. And oftentimes uh, they're unplanned pregnancies. And so uh, Hope Pregnancy Center right now has kind of two branches. One of them is their resource center. So what they do is they give support uh, to these families, these parents who come in and honestly just don't know where to go. Pregnancy is complex and nobody really teaches you what to do. And if they don't have a family structure or a body like this, they don't know where to go. And so uh, they show up to the resource center and uh, get guidance. They get uh, advice. They have a mentor program where they're assigned a mentor. So for the entire pregnancy through the first two years of the child's uh, age, they get a mentor to just walk them through the complexities of all that that entails, uh, which I love so much. They also have an earn to learn program where as people come through to the, the classes that they have at the resource center, they earn credits and they can spend those credits to buy things like bassinets and cribs and uh, bottle warmers, all the things that they would need for free to the patient. The only cost for them is their own education, which is so amazing to me. So that's the resource center. Uh, the Clear Choice Clinic is the other side of that. And they're more of the medical side where with compassion and expertise, they're able to help uh, new parents and uh, oftentimes in the wake of unplanned pregnancies, just 
work through their options and figure out uh, what the best choice is. And they are an amazing organization. Uh, but what they found was most often at the Clear Choice Clinic, a lot of the clients who had come through uh, were in need of care that was really outside the scope of practice for the clinic itself. Uh, they needed a lot of, a lot of their clients needed some counseling for either trauma or hard situations that they were in and they weren't able to provide it. And so uh, what they would do was they would give out referrals and say, hey, like we see this, you, we, we'd recommend you uh, find some counseling. They would write a referral and then the person would never go because they couldn't afford it. And so person after person might have had the symptoms being dealt with, but they never got the root issues dealt with. And so they were carrying uh, those along for the rest of their life. And so what was in their heart and that we are able to help unlock is that they're gonna be able to start providing an in-house counseling service completely free for the clients. How amazing is that? I love it so much because they're gonna be able to start addressing uh, some of these things that have been carried for years and that they would have carried for years had they not had this program. So I am so excited. And this is, as Pastor Levi said, one of 35 initiatives that we get to be a part of as we give with generosity on December 8th.